participating in the worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. A few moments ago, we read several passages out of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written 750 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of 750 years ago. From our time, from our perspective, that carries us back not to the age of rockets and missiles and all the world knowledge that we have today, computer sciences and all those incredible things that we can buy at the store. 750 years ago takes us back to about 1250. It takes us back to the Middle Ages. Can you imagine someone in the Middle Ages prophesying exactly about the birth of someone in the year 2011? That's what we have when we look at the prophet Isaiah concerning the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 7.14 told us, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Two chapters later, we have two of those multiple verses which we have read already that point out for us what the character of that virgin-born son will be. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. In that first verse from which we take the title of the message tonight, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God gives us four magnificent prophecies concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, he will be a divine sign personally given by God. He will be the one who is the proof that God has personally penetrated history. We do not serve a deistic God who wound up the universe and walked away. We serve a God who has given us personally a sign and he has personally penetrated history when he gave us his son. The second thing that that prophecy says is that he will be virgin born. This is so absolutely unique and distinct and different that it has never before happened and never will after happen. This is the one and only virgin birth in all of history. This is one who, because he is virgin born, not only fulfills this prophecy, but is able to fulfill all of the other prophecies of the Old Testament. This is one who, because he is virgin born, fulfills not only Old Testament prophecies, but fulfills those prophecies to the letter as we move through the Gospels. This is the one who, because he is virgin born, is able to fulfill the prophecies concerning his death and resurrection. This is the one who, because he is virgin born, will be able to fulfill all those prophecies which are yet future, which we marvel at as we look at the prophetic New Testament, especially the book of Revelation. The third thing that it declares to us is that this child will be a son and not a daughter. We find in the animal world, the scientists producing what they call parthenogenesis, but it always produces a female and not a male. This one will be a son and the fourth thing states, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Now some might question that. They say, but his name was called Jesus. Well, let's explain to us in that second prophecy, which I read to you, 
which is a descriptive prophecy that God gives to us so that we will have more information about this virgin-born son and what he will do. It tells us that he will be a king. It tells us he will be the head of a government characterized and established by divine order and decree. It tells us he will personally bear the full weight of the government on his shoulders. It tells us what government that will be. It says he will sit on the throne of his father, David. It tells us he will rule over a kingdom established by David, which was the kingdom of the combined Israel and Judah, the northern and the southern tribes. It tells us that his kingdom will rule forever. And he will not only rule forever, but his kingdom will last forever. That is possible only for one who is eternal himself and who lasts forever. It tells us his kingdom will be filled with eternal justice and judgment. Oh, how the earth longs for that, how we see all around us every government on earth that has ever been is filled with wickedness and not with justice and judgment. It tells us his kingdom will be filled with peace. And then the final statement of Isaiah 9, 7 is, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God performs his promise with his own zeal. And when it says the Lord of hosts, that word hosts is armies. We see the armies of heaven coming according to Revelation chapter 19, as our Lord Jesus Christ returns to set up that kingdom. The descriptive prophecy in Isaiah 9 also tells us about the personal character of this one who is the virgin-born son. His name shall be called Wonderful. Very fascinating word. I wish we had time for a word study on that tonight. Pele. It means that which is marvelous, that which is miraculous, the supernatural. It's translated secret on some occasions when God reveals the unknown to man. His name shall be called Wonderful. It also tells us that his name will be called Counselor, Ya'as. One with knowledge, one with wisdom, one who guides in the right way. And then it tells us his name shall be called the Mighty God, El Gibor. God, the mighty hero, it's a clear statement of the deity of this one who is to be virgin born. He will be the mighty God. It tells us his name will be called the everlasting father, Ad, that which is perpetual, that which is eternal, plus Av, the very first word in the Hebrew language, father. He's the father of that which lasts forever, the father of eternity. He's described as being without beginning and without end. The New Testament calls him the Alpha and the Omega the very first letter of the alphabet, the very last letter of the alphabet in Greek. He is the one who has no beginning, the one who has no end, the one who is eternal. And then finally it says his name will be called the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. He is the one who has made peace between God and man through the blood of his cross. Some have tried to claim that this does not refer to Jesus because Jesus was named Jesus by his mother Mary as commanded by the angel. In Luke chapter 1, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. But you see, the problem with claiming this couldn't possibly refer to Jesus because he has the name Jesus and not the name Emmanuel, is this passage cites all the rest of that prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7. It tells us that he's going to be a son. It tells us that he's going to be God. He's going to reign on David's throne. He's going to have an eternal rule over the house of Jacob. He's going to have an unending kingdom all the components of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. The objection disappears, for it is indeed a light objection, when we see that same statement in Isaiah 9, 6 concerning the name. 
His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You see, to the Hebrew mind, the word name describes the character of the individual. He is the one who is indeed Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is also the one who is Emmanuel. What do we mean? Matthew tells us what that means when we read a few of the verses in Matthew 1. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying. And here we have the quotation of Isaiah 7.14. So we have no question that it refers to Jesus. Behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which being interpreted is God with us. Imanu with us. El. God. Emmanuel, that's the name that describes who this child will be. This child will be God with us. God personally breaking into human history that he might provide redemption for sinful men. That's what Christmas is all about. It's not merely about a beautiful scene with a mother and a baby. It's not merely a glorious chorus of angels singing in the sky. It's not about simply shepherds on a hillside taking care of pretty little sheep. It's not about those grand wise men coming and bringing their kingly gifts to a newborn babe. It's about a God who has planned redemption for lost mankind. It's about God himself entering humanity through the virgin birth that he might die on Calvary's cross bearing our sins. When you look to the Lord Jesus, you're not looking at just a human babe. You're not really looking at a man hanging on a cross. You're looking at God incarnate bearing the infinite penalty for sin, which would have condemned every one of us to a pitch-black, flaming hell. And he bore that penalty for you and for me. The meaning of Christmas extends beyond one night in a manger. The meaning of Christmas extends for those who place their faith in Christ to a glorious eternity. That's why we celebrate the birth of this baby. Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ must be both God and man. Undiminished in his nature as God, undiminished in his nature as sinless man. And that is the reason for the virgin birth. You see, he had to be God in order to give us an eternal life. If he were merely a man, he could not give us eternal life. But he had to be a man so that he could fulfill the righteous requirements of God's judgment. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Christmas, the incarnation, means that God became a man. And his purpose in doing it was to offer you the gift of eternal life. That's what Christmas is all about. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that if there's one person here who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, that they might understand that great prophecy given by the angel to Mary for he shall save his people from their sins. 
It was not just a miraculous birth, but it was a birth with a purpose. How our Lord Jesus Christ stooped down from heaven and took upon him the form of a man and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Indeed, that day will come. And those who have trusted Christ will give glory to our Lord Jesus Christ with great joy in their hearts. Those who have resisted will be forced to bow the knee. For our Lord Jesus Christ is also the one who is the judge. How sad for those who reject him. How blessed that you've given us all here tonight the opportunity to receive him, the one who is your gift. In Jesus' name, amen.